This is my GameCube controller. For the most part, it's a pretty standard controller. It came bundled with the GameCube my mom bought for me when I was 7, and I've been using it for about 20 years now. However, it does have a few modifications. I swapped the indigo shell it came with for a turquoise one I found on eBay. I removed the rumble pack to make it lighter in my hands. I removed the spring from the right trigger to make my power shields more consistent, and it also has two C-sticks. Don't ask, that's a story for another time. This is Alex's controller. He's the guy editing this video. His controller is a little bit newer. The switchboard is from a GameCube controller that was released with Smash 4. He swapped out the original black Smash 4 controller shell for a third-party blue one he found on AliExpress. It's got custom white buttons and sticks, and ergonomic triggers that feel better in the hands and look pretty good too. And yes, those are real gold flakes. This is Tommy's controller. He works on the other side of the office. If my controller is retro and Alex's is going out of style, Tommy's is from the future. It's a fob, meaning it uses a custom-built motherboard specifically designed for Smash. It uses magnets to read stick inputs. The left trigger was replaced with a mouse click, providing perfect tactile feedback, while the right one has a shortened spring, making it easier to click. You can remap buttons, recalibrate your sticks at any time, and ensure that this controller is operating just how you want it, regardless of how long you've been using it for. In short, playing with this controller is like driving a Ferrari. It's responsive, it performs well, and it's sexy as hell. So how much do each of these controllers cost? For mine, if you exclude the cool shell I bought for it last year, it costs about $20 in 2001 money. Alex's was modded professionally at a tournament, and the cost of parts plus labor comes out to about $150. Tommy's fob was custom ordered online and took more than six months to arrive. Total cost, $500. So what's the difference between each of these controllers, and why are Smash players spending so much on them? Today, we're going to look at the history of the GameCube controller for Super Smash Bros. Melee. Before we get started, let's get you up to speed on what makes the GameCube controller different from a fight stick used in most fighting games. The buttons are pretty much the same, but the main difference is in the joysticks. Imagine a light. When you press a button, the light turns on, and when you release the button, the light turns off. This is how most fighting games function. You press right, you go right. You press jump, you jump. It's binary. Now imagine a light with a dimmer switch instead. As you slide the switch up, the light gradually gets brighter, and as you slide it down, it gets dimmer. This is melee. When you push the control stick to the right, your character's speed depends on how far the stick is pushed. When you press jump, you can affect the height by holding the stick for longer and then drift forwards and backwards at different speeds. Put into perspective, fighting games are programmed to have eight possible directions that you can move, while melee has 360 directions, all of which slide on a gradient. Tilt moves, aerial drift, shield dropping, tons of moves in melee require insanely precise stick movement, making it crucial for controllers to read inputs quickly and precisely. For this reason, Professional Melee players are notoriously picky about what controllers they use. Something wrong? Mewtwo King would famously attend tournaments with a bag full of controllers, with a different one for each of his characters, plus backups in case something went horribly wrong. Pros have dropped out of tournaments due to controller issues, have put bounties on finding perfectly calibrated ones, and flatly refuse to play if their controller malfunctions. If you're not familiar with Smash, I know what you're thinking. Isn't it just a controller? Aren't they all the same? Well, they're not. So before we jump into it, let's get you up to speed on what makes the GameCube controller different from a fight stick used in most fighting games, namely the analog stick. Unfortunately, original equipment manufacturer controllers, or OEMs for short, use a potentiometer in the stick box. What this means is, even if your controller is perfectly calibrated from the start, which many are not, over time, the movement of the stick against the potentiometer will wear down the hardware, and the motherboard will read inputs differently than it did, say, last week. This is called PODE, or Potentiometer Oddity Degradation Effect, and it's one of the reasons that Smash players are so picky about what controllers they use. If your controller doesn't read inputs consistently, you're not going to have a good time playing this game. For the first 15 years or so of competitive Smash, slight variations in controllers weren't taken that seriously. 
But as the game's meta has become increasingly refined and players have become more reliant on tight execution windows, the desire for consistent controllers skyrocketed. This came to a head in 2015. Around this time, a technique called shield dropping started to become really popular. Up until this point, shielding on a platform was considered generally unsafe because of how easy it was to get stuck with someone sharking you from below. Sure, you could roll, spot dodge, jump, or just drop your shield and get hit, but none of these were really good options. However, there was one other option that wasn't really explored. Shield dropping. If you were shielding on a platform and tilted the analog stick in just the right way, you fall through the platform. Basically, situations like this soon became favorable for the character on the platform, because if their opponent threw out something unsafe, they could shield drop and hit them out of end lag, completely reversing the situation and starting a combo of their own. Every character can utilize this technique, and characters like Jigglypuff, for example, can insta-kill Marth if he tries an unsafe up tilt. Once the technique was mastered and popularized by Plup, shield dropping completely redefined Melee's meta. Unfortunately, this technique is extremely controller dependent. Because not all controllers are calibrated the same, and as we mentioned, Pode affects how controller inputs are read, some controllers are really good at shield dropping. Some do it better on one side than the other, and some struggle to do it at all. In response, players began notching the shells of their controllers to make the technique easier to execute, literally taking a file and physically altering their shells. This led to a melee arms race, as players began hoarding better, more precise controllers and modding them with greater audacity. Controller notching makes it easier to hit precise angles. This works not only for shield dropping, but nailing longer wave dashes, inputting better DI, or precisely hitting any of Fox's 352 up B angles. But modders and players weren't content with just modding the outside of their controllers. Some wanted to go inside. Another technique that is controller dependent is Smash Turn, aka Backdash, aka the infamous Dash Back. It's a really simple technique where your character is standing or crouching facing one direction and you try to dash in the opposite direction. Sounds easy, right? Well, it depends on your controller. We won't get too technical, but basically, snapback is dependent on the potentiometer and is affected by something called controller polling, which is just how the game reads inputs from the controller. The way the game reads these inputs is dependent on how the controller is calibrated and the controller's calibration is subject to Pode. You can see why this might be an issue. On top of this, great dashback is usually mechanically tied to other analog stick problems. So even if you find a good controller for this technique, it might accidentally turn around when you neutral B, and it could just be useless for shield dropping. To try and combat this, people developed a number of workarounds. Some suggested using silicon grease in the stick box, some tried installing snapback capacitors, like our boy Alex, and some directly modded the motherboards of their controllers with Arduinos, to varying levels of success. Thankfully, the matter was put to rest in 2016 by Dan Salvato, who released the Universal Controller Fix. In short, UCF is a software mod that adjusts the way Melee reads inputs to make controllers more consistent. It doesn't nerf better controllers, but it does help quote-unquote bad controllers operate at a more consistent level. UCF was developed and has been endorsed by some of the most knowledgeable members of Melee's modding community and quickly became the default at large tournaments. Melee's meta continued to push forward, and players have become obsessed with being frame perfect. For this reason, they're willing to dole out hundreds of dollars for modded motherboards called... Wait, what the is that? Oh my god, do we have to? We do? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> this is a box controller. You can tell it's a box because of the way it is. It's fully digital, ergonomic, and tournament legal. Plus, it's super controversial. Let's quickly talk about why this thing was invented in the first place. Melee is a notoriously high APM game. It's physically demanding on the fingers and forearms and can lead to some serious health issues. More than one top player has been forced to step away from the game or retire completely due to complications related to hand pain. Mewtwo King played through hand pain for years before finally being convinced to see a doctor. Hand pain contributed to Silent Wolf retiring early and one of the fastest players of all time, Hacks Money, had to have surgery to remove a calcified bone in his hand. To remedy this problem, the Smash community has experimented with all sorts of new controllers over the years. While these abominations never really took hold, 
One design became the flagship for a new generation of Smash controllers. Quick disclaimer, there was some shady stuff going on when the box first was released. We're not going to get into the details, but there were claims of designs being stolen, backs being stabbed, and feelings being hurt. Just to get that out of the way. The first commercial box controller was the Smashbox, developed by Hitbox in 2016. The layout is visually similar to that of a GameCube controller, with the exception of buttons rather than sticks. Soon after, Hax announced the Box, which featured a slightly more ergonomic design and his own personal endorsement. Today, most box controllers look like Hax's box. Frame 1, junk food, this, uh, thing. Regardless of layout, boxes are completely digital. To compensate for only having four directional buttons, these controllers have toggles which can be pressed in conjunction with C-stick inputs to move between angles. In short, box controllers trade off a total number of possible inputs for fewer, perfectly consistent ones. But this perfect consistency makes certain techniques a little bit easier. Full-length wave dashes, perfect Firefox angles, options out of shield. This simplification of a game that prides itself on being difficult has left a few players a little bit upset. But then I lose the f box Pikachu. Cheater! While the box was initially created to be an ergonomic solution to Melee's hand problem, its controversial effects are still being felt today. Box players often have their wins diminished because of the controller they're using. Many fear the inherent advantage of having perfectly consistent inputs will make regular GameCube controllers obsolete. Some players even use specific character counter picks with a box controller to overcome particularly difficult matchups and bracket demons. Ooh, the, the Hold on, he's, he's out. busted out the frame one. Oh, you Let's know what? See. Me personally, after months of fighting box fox after box fox on Slippy Unranked, I found myself sitting firmly in the camp of box players are cheaters. However, after 20 minutes of playing on one, I was having so much fun, I seriously considered pre-ordering a box with my next paycheck. But regardless of personal opinion, these controllers are tournament legal. Period. Love them or hate them, they're a part of the game we play. Plus, if box controllers can have perfect digital inputs, what's to stop regular GameCube controllers from having something similar? It's a good question. And GameCube controller technology took a quantum leap forward when one man decided to see how far he could take an OEM. This is a Goom Wave. It's a controller developed by Goomy, a Samus player known for their zoomies. While it may look like a normal controller on the outside, the inside features a custom printed circuit board or PCB. This PCB allows the controller to be customized in several ways. You can recalibrate notches, add virtual analog trigger stoppers, customize the dead zone and sensitivity of analog stick ranges, and adjust the effects of Pode. In short, you can make it so your controller behaves exactly how you want it, when you want it. However, Goom Waves have some customizations that are borderline cheating. For instance, remapping analog zones, i.e. changing the distance you need to push the stick before it activates a jump, makes moves like up tilt easier. The controllers also have the capacity to guess what you're going to input and adjust the analog stick coordinates accordingly. For example, the controller can lock you out of fast fall to help with ledge dashing. It can make it easier to instant dash back out of crouch and change your inputs to more consistently pivot and pivot tilt. By all accounts, these last three are macros and blatant cheating. To top it all off, the source code used for Goom Waves are a secret, so the extent of how they function is still not fully understood. Needless to say, Goom Waves have been banned by numerous Smash communities. And while they were once championed by top players like Mango and Zane, the community decided that this wasn't the way that Melee was meant to be played, and they quickly fell out of fashion. Which brings us to the last type of controller, Tommy's FOB. A FOB, like a Goom Wave, uses a custom PCB. However, its firmware is fully open source, so tournament organizers know without a shadow of a doubt that the controller isn't doing any black magic bullshit to give the player training wheels. FOBs still allow you to remap buttons, adjust dead zones to line up with your notches, and recalibrate for 1.0 cardinals and 0.7 corners, but it's all done fairly. FOBs also use magnets rather than a traditional potentiometer to combat the issue of Pode. Unfortunately, these magnets are notoriously fragile, so if you drop your controller, there's a good chance you might need to buy one. Plus, they're prohibitively expensive, with certain players spending a lot of money on them, trying to find the perfect FOB. But since the firmware is open source, you could theoretically print your own PCB and make your own FOB. That's what a lot of modders do, and they make a lot of money off it. Today, FOBs are used by pretty much everyone at the top level. And after playing with Tommy's for a few game, I can understand why. 
This thing feels amazing. The FOB is a great answer to the issue of Pode. It's consistent, competitive, and doesn't stray too far from the controllers we've used for more than two decades. And I know what you're thinking. Do I really have to drop hundreds of dollars just to play this game? In short, no. It all depends on how competitive you want to be. If you're like me and you boot up unranked once a week, you probably don't need to drop, well, any money. But if you want to take this melee thing seriously, putting yourself in the best position to succeed is a really important part of the game. But whether it's an OEM, a box, or a fob, whatever you feel comfortable playing with is probably right for you. Melee is a game with depth and nuance, and unless you're a top competitor, as long as your controller feels good and you're having fun, that's what really matters. Special shout out to Kevin Deere for lending us his box and frame one controllers. Even though you're a box player, we still love you. This video is made possible thanks to our wonderful patrons. Massive thank you to everyone on this list, and shout out to B, Cloud, Kiaustik, Shampoo, Spartacus, and Yashichi for being Platinum supporters, as well as an extra special shout out to Steph for being our Diamond supporter. Thanks guys, we really appreciate it. If you want to talk to us, check out our Discord. If you want to support our channel and get info on unreleased videos, check out our Patreon. If you want to help us out in a different way, leaving a like, subscribing, and hitting the bell to stay up to date is also appreciated. My name is Jonah, thanks for watching.